action horse race on the stage of its kind, inspiring a succession of similar sensation scenes. We have Daybreak in 1884, A Run of Luck in 1886, County Fair in 1889, The Prodigal Daughter in 1892, The Derby Winner in 1894, Ben Hur 1902, The Race for the Derby in 1905, and then The Whip in 1909, followed by 1911, The Hope. Across these examples then, several key innovations in stage machinery and effect occurred, not only to freshen the situation from pre predecessors' efforts, but also in an ongoing attempt to strive for greater realism, and, crucially, to ensure that the winning horse actually won on the night, frequent instances when it's not supposed to go that way. In daybreak, eight horses raced across the stage in an exceedingly realistic scene, whereas in County Fair, only three horses, each saddled with a jockey, appeared to race across the stage to the winning post. However, all three horses were secured by wire rope, which ran off stage. While the horses were in motion, they remained stationary as three flexible platforms moved in tandem with the background scenery to suggest continual movement by means of two rollers, powered by electric motors. As the finish line approached, the winning horse's rope is slackened to allow it to nose ahead while the others are tightened. The Derby winner, praised for presenting as much reality as it is possible to achieve upon the stage without falling either into absurdity or vulgarity, <laughs> featured three parallel treadmills. And, and obviously the reviews for this are sort of, you know, the, the innovation, the sort of the, the freshness, etc. Um, less than a decade later, we have Ben Hur. Now this comprised of four great cradles, 20 foot in length and 14 foot wide each with a treadmill, allowing the horses to race against one another so as the horse gallops, the treadmill revolved and the scenery moved at a pace of 1,200 feet a minute. And there's also 22 horses in ben -Hur, so just imagining that on the Drury Lane stage space is, is quite a lot. <coughs> By 1909, the whip stage machinery had extensively improved and with the skills of Sensation Smith, Bruce Smith that we heard about earlier, at Drury Lane, the stage realism of a horse race was elevated even further. While the horse still ran from stage left to stage right, it was now against a backdrop of five rather than one moving panoramas, each angled, motor-driven, and moving in the opposite direction to the horses to suggest greater movement and speed. Instead of horses controlled by wire rope, the whip and its counterparts ran on individual treadmills, each controlled by a system of pulleys and weights, ensuring a more dynamic looking race and a guaranteed winner, crucially. After a number of near misses at Drury Lane as well, they employed a stunt horse, allowing the real thoroughbred to appear in the race, and it's double for the early sensation scene of a train crash. They'd learnt the hard way when an earlier horse had been injured. In direct competition with Drury Lane, the Coliseum staged its own derby race in 1905. Using a revolving stage, the racetrack was 24 foot wide, formed of two distinct circular parts locked together by six iron locks. It was covered in green felt to prevent hoof slippage. As the revolve moved at a speed between 14 to 15 miles per hour, approximately 20 seconds for a revolution, the highest speed was 20 miles per hour and the horses galloped in the opposite direction at 12 to 15 miles per hour. Nearing its 100th performance, the Derby race was a thrilling spectacle, reviewed as having so clever a mechanical stage device that the horses appeared galloping at real racehorse speed. But it proved to be, in the words of a newspaper headline, a jockey's death ride. This is where I'm taking a darker turn, everybody. <laughs> an account from an audience member details the incident. I saw the six horses come into view through a gap in the scenery to the right of the stage. They were on the revolving part of the stage and were riding two abreast. By the time they reached the centre of the stage, three of the horses appeared to be getting rather close together. And then the middle horse of the three suddenly slipped and went down on its haunches. The rider, Grice, appeared to be doing his best to assist the animal to regain its feet, but failed and the horse was carried along a certain distance by the revolving stage and then fell against the proscenium whence it was thrown by the movement of the stage into the orchestra. I think you know where this is going. <coughs> he did not see what became of the jockey, Fred Rice, but the inquest
first reported a fractured skull as chief amongst the numerous injuries. Recorded as an accidental death, it was regarded as more human error than mechanical, with Grice critiqued for having tried to win a fixed race. But this is just one example of the risk, human, animal and mechanical, in achieving stage realism at this time. And horses weren't the only endangered animal. Lions, elephants, camels, dogs were all in peril too, and were even victims of the stage trap. So the trap has been associated with the stage, though it is the least delusive of devices. Critiqued for its often clunky, noisy movement in two, it too experiences reinvention. Developing from various openings in the stage floor, each, individual, each individually pulled by ropes, um, counterweights and physical strength, and later steam, to Edwin Sachs' proposition that each trap goes straight across the stage and is divided into three parts, each of which rests on the plunger of the hydraulic press so it can be raised or lowered either independently or simultaneously, resulting in a far swifter ascent or descent. Already regarded as dangerous devices, Sachs' suggestion raised concerns that hydraulic power would result in even more trap-related accidents. As Julius Rudolph, stage engineer stated. In a trap raised by hydraulics, an actor has no power to ease or stop its movement, whereas in the old system of counterweights, some effort exercised by the actor would often enable him to disentangle himself. Even the ordinary counterweight trap is not free from danger, as many can testify. There have been frequent cases when the actor has been severely crushed between the stage floor and the trap, but if such an accident were to happen when hydraulic power is used, the body would be simply shattered. Oh no, don't bring, hold your punches. Um, unfortunately, trap-related accidents, grave trap, star trap, leap trap, vampire trap, Corsican trap, so named after the plague, were occupational hazards and frequent occurrences. <coughs> During Alibaba at the Lyceum in Sunderland in 1868, Clown J.H. Hudspeth was to exit and re-enter via a canvas leap trap for a transformation scene. Known as the lion's leap or a leap in the dark, the illusion was dependent on stagehands catching the performer as they exited the stage at speed. However, on this occasion, Purse and Brown had walked away, and Hudspeth narrowly avoided breaking his neck on the adjacent brick wall. Suspicions were that Hudspeth hadn't paid some additional catch money, aka beer money, and they decided to teach him a lesson. In 1880, Charles Harcourt fell through a grave trap at the Globe Theatre and died. The same year at the Theatre Royal Bolton, three performers fell down a vampire trap in quick succession, killing the first through and severely injuring the other two plus a stagehand. John Walker's <coughs> head carpenter at Covent Garden died after falling 27 feet from stage to cellar, and in 1893, I thought I should whisper this bit because it's about the time theatre. In 1893, the time William Wood, a 12-year-old boy engaged for the doll scene in a recent pantomime, died after falling 22 feet through the opening under a bridge that had been raised in preparation for the second act. I'm not conjuring a ghost, okay. <laughs> Another on-stage danger and, and trick was for stage illusion was the use of weaponry, designed to fool the eye, trick daggers and swords with a button foil, a mechanism to collapse the blade, were frequently to blame for various injuries and on occasion fatalities. And actually the image here, this, um, this depicts um, a sheathed sword, so the mechanism was the apparatus would match up with the counterpart, which would then be raised to the coattails of the, of the sort of victim's jacket. In 1896, during the final act of Frank Harvey's melodrama Sins of the Night at the Novelty Theatre, Crozier, in his villainous role as Manuel Ramirez, is stabbed in an act of familial revenge by Pablo, played by William Mons Franks. On the 10th of August, Crozier was fatally wounded. An inquest concluded that the springer in the sharp and slender stiletto dagger was faulty, but, and this is crucial, had, crazy, had Crozier worn even a thicker linen shirt, it may have made all the difference. The, conclu I know, brutal. the conclusion was homicide by misadventure. So the Crozier case was a flashpoint moment, and, and it highlights several key issues sort of underpinning this paper, but as part of my broader sort of lines of inquiry and consideration. 
Firstly, the danger to the performer in the quest for realistic stage depictions. So as Tracy Davis has noted, concern for audiences long predated concern for the theatre's employees, and the standards specified for workers were out of sync with other industrial sectors. Crozier's death, as the newspapers signalled, brought forth a wail not only loud but long from certain sections of the dramatic profession on the dangerous nature of their calling. At the time of Crozier's death, the Dangerous Performance Act had come into law two years prior, but it only covered children under the age of 14, prohibiting their taking part, quote, in any public exhibitions or performance whereby life or limbs of such child shall be endangered. Contravening the law brought penalties of £10 and possible pr prosecution. So far, I've found very little evidence of either be happening, taking place. In 1897, the provisions were extended to include any male person under 16 and female under 18. At no point in the legislation was a definition of what actually constituted dangerous performance offered. By 1906, and the highly publicised deaths of balloonist Lily Cove and Edith Brooks, the Home Secretary, Herbert Gladstone, proposed amendments to the Act to include all women. Public and professional dissent was voluble. Considering that the sensational has formed a prominent element in public amusement since the earliest days, a drastic alteration of the law, such as is now indicated, will cause something like panic in certain of the professional ranks. All quarters challenged the ambiguity of dangerous performance, and George R. Sims even penned an 1898 drama by the same name, an in-conversation-style piece, which closed with the Home Secretary concluding, We'll leave these dangerous performances alone in future. You see, if once we start on that sort of thing, where are we going to draw the line? The proposed amendments were dropped. So two, to go back to flashpoints from Crozier's fatal stabbing. It also prompted disputes as to what extent stage accidents were hushed up in the profession or openly declared. So far from my research, I suspect it's actually mainly the former. Three, the framing of these stage accidents, most often it is argued that it's human error, so it's man, not machine, that is to blame for what actually happens. And death by misadventure or accidental death are most commonly the inquest findings. There's only one or two examples I've found so far where they've actually said it, it's manslaughter and somebody has gone to prison. The concurrent, so four, the concurrent popular debates around realism on stage even with some headlines using exactly that turn of phrase to describe theatre fatalities. And last and five, that the audience left the theatre without being aware of the shocking tragedy that had been enacted. So the performance had continued for the last few minutes, as Grozier was lying there bleeding to death, basically, um, and he'd only received assistance after the curtain drop. And again, from what I've looked at, this is really not uncommon. Um, the sort of show must go on mentality, it, it, it carries across that even you know, if somebody's being fatally injured, let, let's keep going until the final act. Um, so there's an interesting tension here again about the growing accustomed to real life representations on stage, such that what were audiences able to differentiate the stage business as well. The era remarked that the moral of Paul Crozier's death was all weapons used in the mimic combats of the stage should be as harmless as they can be made, short of injury to the illusion. Hmm, interesting kind of uh, loophole there, he thinks. In Clement Scott's 1897 work, The Wheel of Life, he notes the general use of real weapons on stage and that it is idle to say that experienced actors cannot go wrong in such matters. The facts of the stage prove the contrary. In the same year as Crozier's death, 1896, real gun-related stage accidents were also common. Wilfred Sluin in Lord Annerley was accidentally shot, as was Frances Delavelle in Tommy Atkins, and the shot to her thigh caused her dress to catch fire too. Um, and in the Mandarin at the Leicester Theatre Royal, seven were injured when real bullets were accidentally loaded. And um, <laughs> seven. How did it take them that long to realise? Um, and that's not to mention, um, as pictured, the loss of life through all the various William Tell sort of um, uh, acts. And yeah, <laughs> um, there's a lot. And injuries behind the scenes from, from gun preparation as well. Um, if you're interested in the image 
on the right, I've helpfully put an arrow in the top right <laughs> corner to show you the young boy who was killed when the cannon misfired. Oh. As well as dodging bullets then, actors were at the mercy of set and scenery too. Charles Wyndham reportedly had an annual stage accident. And whereas Wilson Barrett was accidentally injured um, on more than one occasion by intentionally falling scenery in the production of Claudian in 1888, Gladys Francis, who played the principal boy in The Forty Thieves at Brighton Theatre, was killed outright when a set pillar accidentally fell on her. Now, fatalities from water-related spectacles are another paper, <laughs> so <laughs> that's it. Um, but instances of near drowning and pneumonia were additional occupational hazards, as well as boats accidentally capsizing. So Kyle Bellew and Mary Lytton were both injured in mankind at the Globe in 1882, when their boat capsized. And actually, with some of the stage machinery underneath, Kyle Bellew, he gets the rope wrapped around his neck and sort of severely injured. So it's grisly, folks. <laughs> um, and Stanley Towers was killed after falling 40 feet into a water tank during a performance of the Redskins at the Hippodrome in 1903. In Perils of an Actor's Life in 1896, the author asks, Has the reader ever stood upon the stage and looked up into the flies, I wonder, with its rows of cloths on heavy rollers suspended some 30 or 40 feet above him, its borders and its battens? If so, he may realise the danger of something breaking away. Perhaps he might also consider the danger back and above stage two, with mechanical things run under department masters, master carpenter, electric engineer, limelight master, props master, gas engineer, all working behind the scenes. It was equally, if not more, perilous as being on the stage space. And there's just a, a little shout out here, um, as David showed us yesterday, to the 1901 uh, Time Theatre fly staff as well. So explosions from leaking hydrogen and oxygen bags and tanks needed to make the limelight were frequently featured in newspaper reports, as did deaths from falling weights and falls from the flies. The drop from rig to stage could be between 20 to 50 or more feet, and fatalities occurred at all times, including during the performances. In the 1889 production of Babes in the Wood at the Grand Theatre Glasgow, Robert Potts fell 22 feet to his death. The newspaper reported that Miss Rosalie stepped to the, ste stepped to the edge of the stage so that the light would be away from the prostrated form of Potts and continued to sing her love song without interruption. <laughs> Similarly, in 1893, William Jessup fell while shifting scenery for Sinbad the Sailor at the Alexandra Theatre in Sheffield. Again reported as, the scene dropped just as the man fell behind it, and consequently the audience, which quite filled the theatre, were in ignorance of the accident. The performance proceeded without interruption. He died. He leaves a widow and eight children. <laughs> for those left behind after such a loss, and indeed for those who survived serious injury, an increasingly popular recourse from the late 1880s onwards was to sue theatre management for negligence. So the human cost of spectacle was also adding additional economic costs to those initially incurred in mounting the production. Litigation and compensation were now a factor. So to conclude then, as Jim Davis has argued, the centrality of visual experience to so many forms of 19th century entertainment was to some extent due to the centrality of new technologies in recreating and redefining the experience of the spectator in this period. And I've just put, um, so this is a cross section of um, Theatre Royal Drury Lane. And as I'm thinking about this relationship of seeing, concealing, revealing, this is kind of a bit of a micro macro moment about all the sort of space that it takes to obviously facilitate and make the production. But I also put it there for that. I know a lot of people in the room have an awareness of this already, but the sense of height that actually, if you're up in the flies and then in the more substantially weighted flies right at the top, that, that fall from there to the stage looks scary, even on that cross section. Mm. So seeing then, as I'm thinking through these three terms, seeing is about during performance as a positive and pleasurable act, the spectacle itself but it can be negative in terms of the distractions of observing the means behind the spectacle, which is consequently then diminished in pleasure terms for the illusion. 
And I think you bet this is what I saw to him now, the scrutinising eye, right? So the one that's always looking in the wings and at the borders to see what they can clock of the machinery. Concealing is in order to be the pinnacle of stagecraft and the ultimate achievement in technical illusion. So all the mechanics and crucially the labour behind this and manufacturing, manufacturing the spectacle should be undetectable and accomplish stage realism. So the suspension of disbelief must be absolute, this is the illusion in excelsis, and this is the duped eye. And then revealing, and actually I thought it was really interesting because revealing is the, the post-performance element. And um, Paul, when he was talking about Pepper's Ghost yesterday, said, um, it's always good to see the trick before you know how it's done. And I thought, yeah, our attitude hasn't really changed in relationship to that. Um, so revealing then post-performance, the public and professional desire to know how the trick was done, as Dickens said. And by what ex exact means, so really going into kind of, you know, quite technical, very high level detail, that the spectacle has been achieved in order to understand and appreciate the skill in its realization. And I'm thinking about this as the sort of knowing or informed eye of the spectator. So crux to this spectatorial operating system is that the safety curtain, so to speak, should only be pulled up after the performance through newspaper articles, theatrical exhibitions, such as the one in South Kensington in 1888, and interviews, behind the scenes gossip, all of the sort of fodder of the press after the performances. And, and that this knowledge of the realities in underpinning realism in stagecraft, including the fatalities, threaten the suspension of disbelief and an engagement and experience that's predicated on perception and deception on stage. Thank you.
which is quite an important matter, and especially where theatre is concerned, as they did often go on quite late in the uh, evening. Um, yeah, there is usually three or four uh, acts, possibly a couple of scenes in each act, so uh, you know, uh, it was a good idea to know that you're going to get home. And, uh, so, I've lost my place. <laughs> Um, so theatres not only in London but in the provinces as well indeed even this very building here is here to a great extent to do with the railways um, the area just to this side here between here and the, the, the railway station used to be the, uh, one of the Irish areas where a large number of navvies who built the railways uh, took up residence and that and uh, the uh, owner of this place, uh, Joseph Cowans, had a, an interest in them. And so one of the reasons why we're here, in this position, is because of the railways. Okay, in this presentation, I'm going to concentrate on the northeast of England, uh, <coughs> the home of passenger railways, as it's a good microcosm to study and is a long way from London, which is always a good thing, because it's always taken a dime right and all that. Um, the fact that it is uh, so far away can uh, illustrate the differences made to, to the playhouses, be they the, the great theatre royals or the sleazy dives of disrepute. I will be using the Time Theatre, uh, Time Theatre's early activities as an illustration, and I will be covering this in four sections. So the progress of the talks will be Theatre in Victorian times, uh, expansion of the railways, railways on stage, and moving productions around the country. Um, now I realise that some of this is going to be teaching your, your granny to, to suck eggs, but uh, it does all come together in the end there. And then of course we have a final wrap up with um, uh, questions right at the end, etc. So, let's start off with, oh, hang on, my fingers are dry, I can't pick up the paper. Told you I was nervous. <laughs> and it's all prepared as well. There we go. Okay, um, so the theatre, the early, um, uh, where are we? The early part of the Victorian times, um, as we all know, we've had it a number of times, we, we had the um, stock company system, whereby you had a stock company uh, in a theatre, and uh, that was basically because um, it was all it was difficult to actually shift stuff around. Obviously, you've got um, individual star actors doing the rounds because the uh, the railways had started out, as I say, in the eighteen uh, twenties and that, so it had developed up and that. But the actual moving entire um, productions around that, that came later um, wasn't, wasn't the, the thing. So we we got all through that, and uh, of course. In those days, uh, you had to have a royal warrant to, to put on the drama. The drama is dangerous. It uh, can be submissive and, and all the rest of it, so the government doesn't want any nasty things put on. And so you had to get a, that. Now this place, for instance, uh, and the proprietors of this place, uh, George Stanley and Joseph Cowens, uh, were trying to get a, a license for this place for a long time. And uh, uh, due to the um, effect of the Theatre Royal down the road, uh, they missed out on it. Eventually they did get one, and of course, and, that, and we got this place built. Uh, and it was very much uh, a, a socialist endeavour, and it was designed for everybody to be able to come and see the drama, the opera, which is why it's the Time Theatre and Opera House, and that. And, um, you know, it's designed so you've got the hoi polloi sitting down where you love to sit in now, <laughs> and uh, then you've got the people who wanted to see the theatre and that a few, few bob to spare in the uh, grand circle, and so on up to the gods where uh, it was a tanner of time and uh, uh, anybody could get in and see things. And it, it was very much uh, along that line. Now, most of the theatres of the... Uh, 1860, uh, 1860s, sorry, and 70s, worked on the stock company system and that. And it wasn't until uh, it was the, the, the uh, railways had developed the technology to actually get things around that it uh, very much did. And it was, you know, the, 
the technology didn't only uh, fit for that, so you had the sophisticated that old stuff that we've, we've heard a lot of about already. Okay? Now, the important thing about this paper, it goes on about the, uh, the, uh, the way that the uh, railway is developed. Now, this, if you go down to Time Mount Metro Station, you'll see this plaque on the wall. It's made up of uh, ceramic tiles, and it shows the uh, Northeast Railway system as it was. Now, if you look at all the towns and villages on that, they all had some sort of uh, performance uh, thing, either a theatre, a music hall, uh, a pub with a stage in it. And then it, was, it was all going on there. So then it was that, but it was very localised. Uh, we sometimes forget that um, uh, here we are standing in Newcastle, we've got North Shields just down the road. We just get a bus there, and it takes an hour to get there on the bus, we just keep stopping, and they keep you know. But um, in those days, it would have taken a, 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 a good day to get there on the horse and cart. The, the uh, railways revolutionised uh, that sort of thing and got it going and uh, put, put, to put it together. And um, in fact, the, the line from Newcastle to, uh, 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 yeah, I've got the name of the place, uh, North Shields was one of the first electrified railways in the country. So it was uh, quite a, a popular popularly used one, and uh, Time House Station was the first terminal, then it, it went around the coast up to Whitley Bay and Monk Seaton, but it's also got big uh, 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 metro stations there, so that. Yeah. Now, as the uh, ability to actually go along that and the increased uh, uh, passenger usage was uh, coming along, uh, people like, uh, like Thomas Cook in 1841, started organising excursions um, uh, to seasides and other tourist attractions. And theatre managers, well, they were no less enterprising and began to arrange uh, for extra services to run before and then after the final curtain came down to, uh, on the show, therefore ensuring the theatre goers could get home relatively safely. Now this up here. Uh, by the way, the uh, transcript is just the bottom half of this, uh, the uh, newspaper item. This is a, a, a paper and an ad. This is the first time I came, came across uh, this idea of, of theatre excursions in the uh, thing, and it's uh, for a uh, opera company uh, by the name of, not Thomas Cook, I'm reading the wrong line again, I'm stuck in that. It's, as I tell you, I wasn't very good uh, really up to it. Um, Carl Rosa Opera Company, that's it. Now Carl Rosa and, and his opera company have been coming here for a, quite a while uh, before this ad uh, appeared and uh, it was regular basis. They came at least once a year, sometimes twice a year and performed uh, operas uh, in English as opposed to uh, in their, the, the, the language that they were written in. And so they were very popular and uh, that. Now if you look at the um, the list, sorry, I got away from the thing there. If you look at the list of uh, towns at the bottom there, you can see Time Out from the Whitley Bay, um, Durham, that's it, the city of Durham, not the county, uh, Sunderland, Jarrow and South Shields, <coughs> Time Out, these were all now accessible. People could actually go there uh, or come here on these excursion trains and be assured that they could get home again. Because obviously, you know, there wasn't actually very much between, say, uh, Tynemouth and uh, uh, Newcastle in terms of roads. Uh, there was Wall's End halfway uh, uh, through, which uh, uh, for, to those who were Roman uh, students was uh, called Sedibunum mm -hmm. in those days. And, uh, that. But, uh, you know, most of the, it was empty space, so it wasn't a very good way to get around unless you had your own carriage or something like that. So the, the, the range of which uh, people could come and see um, big spectacles like the uh, Carl Rosa Company, like some of the Shakespeare companies that were done, and that was, was greatly uh, uh, opened out. And indeed, um, of course, it, one of the best ways is the pantomimes. 
Hands and Minds, of course, in those days lasted uh, two to three months, and of course, it, you needed to keep the people coming in. And it, like today, uh, pantomimes were the, uh, the thing that paid for the rest of the seasons uh, uh, in, in the theatre. They kept them open for the rest of the year. So they wanted to get as many people in as that. They changed that. So if they provided um, these things, they bring in that. And it, to a certain extent, the, the <coughs> excursions actually kept theatre going for a, a, a long while. And that. Uh, I've lost my page again. And so basically, that's. Now, the next question is the railway is on stage. I get this. Right. The first one that um, was uh, uh, that dealt with the railways on stage actually here, that is uh, one called, as you can see, Under the Gaslight. Uh, this is about the third or fourth production actually on this stage. And uh, this is actually the, the poster for, for this. And it consists, at the end of the, uh, or near the end, it consisted of a scene whereby the heroine rescues the hero from the, ra from the uh, uh, railway track and causes a, a big train disaster. Now, of course, it didn't actually happen on the stage as such. It uh, was all done by uh, lights and smoke and mirrors and all the rest of it and the use of our uh, machinery in there. So you didn't actually see a train on the track. Uh, but, and we've just seen uh, uh, one part of this picture. This is a scene from The Whip. It's probably the same production as we just seen uh, earlier. And as you can see now, we've got an entire train on the stage. And uh, it would have actually crashed and uh, started smoking and, and billowing smoke and what have we. So over the years, these things um, changed and that. And there are a whole load of other um, railway orientated um, uh, things going on. And indeed, it's still quite a um, popular genre. Uh, just over the last year or so, um, I've seen, uh, well, I haven't actually seen the play, but I've seen adverts for uh, Murder on the Orient Express. That's there. Brief Encounters. That was at the People's as well, by the way. Um, the Railway Children, and one of my favourite uh, things, The Ghost Train. And, that. and they've all you know, played on, on the Tyneside area, as I say, over the last uh, year or so. Um, so they are still quite popular. Now, we get to the crux of the matter. Moving productions around the county, uh, the country. County? The country. <laughs> Can't read either. Um, now, obviously, um, by the time the, the, we sh uh, they uh, started doing what that um, image of uh, Carl Rose's um, uh, advert about there, um, the, the stock companies had, had pretty much gone. Um, uh, Richard uh, Young was the manager here. Uh, George Stanley had moved on to uh, Newfields and that, and. He took the, basically the stock company went with him, and, it, it, no, and they were bringing in uh, productions uh, that, and it was the railways that were bringing them uh, around, all the way from London, uh, Manchester, uh, Liverpool, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and that, and that. And of course, they needed um, good uh, things to bring them on. <coughs> now, plays, you know, they were, Three or four acts, as I said, and uh, quite often different scenes in each act. So there, there was a hell of a lot of stuff that was uh, being brought, brought around. So you needed to put them into um, fairly substantial goods wagons. Now one of the things obviously that, uh, that would have been there would have been the um, drops. Uh, that. And obviously they're, they're quite big, you know, they're, they're about 12 foot by 12 foot, if not a bit bigger at least, and uh, I checked, out, checked this out with the people who actually provide us with uh, props for uh, this stage as well, and they, they, they were a bit astonished that uh, somebody was asking such a stupid question, but, uh, that. but the, the thing is that we've got standard um, goods trucks to deal with, 
Now, the one at the bottom is the, uh, the longest one. Uh, it, it's about, um, just about 12 foot long. And then you've got the standard um, normal sized goods tra uh, train, which is about, uh, well, it's about half that size. Um, now, if you've got a, a drop, the most sensible way of doing it is to roll it onto a, a piece of wood and stick it on a, a um, flatbed. Unfortunately, we're talking about stage sets and canvas and paint, so if you put that and in our climate and it rains, you, <laughs> you've lost your set, basically. So the, the, uh, but if you notice the size of the doors on this thing, the, the, long, the longest one here, you would not get a full um, backdrop into, into that carriage. Uh, there were some that you could take the lids off, and uh, they were usually used for transporting giraffes around the country <laughs> and things like that. But it, it could be done, but it was, would still be. So the, the, the chances are, I don't know this for certain, but they would have folded up the, the drops in, in the nicest possible way and loaded them in through the door. And that. Now, obviously, that would have caused a bit of damage. Obviously, you know, the, the paint and the canvas, they would have cracked up. And um, I, I have a, a theory that um, this is one of the reasons why, uh, as the um, acting uh, stock companies vanished, the technical stock companies didn't. Because somebody had to repair those uh, on a Sunday afternoon. So you needed your own uh, crews to deal with it. It's all going to be rigged as well, so you, you've got to have them there. And that. So uh, one of the influences of transporting stuff around is it kept uh, your technical crews in your theatre and uh, that. I, I've got no proof of this, but it's just a theory and that. But, um, you know, and of course you've got, got things like the, your, your big baskets uh, and that for uh, costumes and props and that, which is done in the little one. You've got the actors which would go on the, uh, would go into the uh, 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 other bits and pieces. So these um, trucks and the way that it was brought that was, uh, you know, quite important. So it, it had an influence in, in that sort of way as well. And oh. I, so where are we? So I mean, uh, so if you if you can imagine what, what's going on, Saturday night show finishes eleven o'clock ish. Um, all the audience who still want a, a drink be out in the, uh, the bars around the place, the, that, and the uh, curtain would be down. Behind there, the uh, stage crews would be feverishly taking down uh, that production set, because for a start, that's got to go to the next theatre. It might be just down the road in North Shields or South Shields, it might be up in uh, that or down to uh, Derby or somewhere like that. So this has got to, so it's got to be ready to be uh, loaded onto um, uh, carts, what's that? Um, in the corner there, when you see the, um, uh, uh, when we go on the stage tomorrow, you'll see that there's a, a, a big arched door, which is about uh, 13 to 14 feet, which is the standard size for a, that? there's a slope that goes down, or used to go down, it only goes halfway now, because they took, put steps in instead, so you can't do, take your, but it goes down to another door that, that size down in uh, Fulton Street next to the stage door. And uh, there are two there, there now. There's a narrow one and a wide one. The wide one goes underneath the stage, the narrow one comes up here. And that. But the, they took it out there um, on a Sunday morning, because that's when the uh, set from the next play would have turned up. So they would have unloaded that, put that up here out of the way, got the uh, set that they took down over Saturday night onto the uh, trucks that would take them down to the, the station, which is obviously just about uh, a few hundred metres in that direction, uh, and that unload them. We're very lucky because we're very close to the, uh, the, 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 the uh, station here and the, the goods yard, and that, which is also where Stevenson used to build rockets, by the way, down there. So if anybody's interested in uh, locomotives. And uh, so they loaded on, and that would go off there and on uh, Sunday afternoon and Monday. The sets would be set up, and we've got four different sets, uh, four different acts, and that. So it's quite.
kind of job to do. And that, so that would all be going on, but it would all be governed by ending on the uh, Sunday and getting those stuff on time, onto the trucks, uh, uh, and that. So, this is about it. So, just to sum up, so, in these times of the combustion engine, um, and jets, and uh, electrical engines used by long distance, and lorry transport, and all, all sorts of stuff, high speed rail and that, you sometimes forget uh, about the distances between towns uh, in Victorian time, and the, uh, the, the dreadful state of some of the roads. I mean, they were improving, obviously, over the thing. And to actually get a system whereby yeah, the, the railways were a, a godsend. And, uh, without them, we probably wouldn't have theatre as we know it today uh, going up. Because that, that. And they were relatively cheap in those days as well. They were always... Uh, that, and that. So, that, that's it. But, now, the pièce de résistance, or something like that. I never could do French. I can't do English much of that. But, but, uh, so, uh, just to sum things up, I said so. Ladies and gentlemen, the Time Theatre and Opera House is proud to announce the first visit of the Swedish Nightingale itself. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> there we go. The Jenny Lind. Now, the portrait is of the lady herself. She never appeared here. She retired before this place was built. So we, we, we don't actually have her here. But uh, obviously, she, uh, what I've found here is this lovely drawing of, of the locomotive, uh, which uh, we're not sure whether that one was, uh, it, you know, they were all built here. They were built in a various um, uh, engineering works across the northeast. So that, but uh, whether or not Jenny Lind was actually built here, we're not sure of. But um, we found this lovely um, drawing of it in a, a railway magazine. And this is a model of it. There's slight differences between the model and the drawing, but uh, that. So, and it represents the, the, the fact that um, our transport system uh, needed names. So then, as now even, famous people and uh, that uh, were used to name the locomotives that pulled the trains. And it's these locomotives that that. I did actually try to get a, a, a steam whistle to, to play the the anger scene of the uh, Queen of the Night from Mozart's Magic Flute, but uh, I'm afraid the technology failed me. So. Uh, but so that's it. Um, hope you it's uh, in, in, inspired you, and uh, I shall sit down and stop sweating. <laughs> Providing a weekly peer review blog 
and he's co-host of over 100 episodes now of the popular fantasy stroke animation podcast, which we frequently features in Apple's top 100 film and TV podcasts. Please welcome Alexander. Interesting suggests this is not um, my comfort zone. Um, I've become very interested in a filmmaker uh, by the name of Herbert Brennan, who I'm going to talk a lot about over the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, my interest in Brennan has come out of the research interests highlighted in my introduction. Um, I consider him to be one of the most um, important fabulists of the first half of the 20th century um, and one of the most um, neglected filmmakers of the so called silent era. Um, and that's good for me, at least, because it means I get to write probably the first biography about it, unless someone out there is already beating me to it, uh, in which case I better get on with this talk. Um, but I'm not a, I'm not a theatre um, scholar by any means, um, and uh, to prove it, every time over the last two days someone has said, but of course you'll all know that, I will not know that. Uh, <laughs> I have really in this book, so... Um, uh, I've spent the last 18 months or so trying to get to grips with um, his context in theatre, which again I'm going to talk about, um, because I think it's really important. I think that I'll make that argument in the paper that follows, but I'm, I'm, I'm running the railway tracks down as the train goes down the road, um, to, to borrow Martin's um, paper. Um, so please, I'd, I'd love to hear comments, questions, clarifications, um, bits I've got wrong, bits I've oversimplified. Um, what I'm going to offer here is some speculations on the importance of theatre within Brennan's work um, and the importance of seeing Brennan in the context of, of some of these fabulous um, figures and, and, and innovations that we've been talking about the last couple of days. Um, uh, yes, there was an end of that sentence, and it was going to be good. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about the importance of all those things, um, uh, and uh, I'm going to reflect on about uh, a year's worth of, of looking through some archives, both digital, so this comes out of um, a couple of thousand newspaper articles I've been finding on Brennan, both in his theatrical work and his filmmaking, um, and I've just returned from about a three-month uh, trip around the States, um, looking at various archives, um, which I'm still processing, um, but I'll try and share some goodies from what I found on the journey. So who's Herbert Brennan, for those who've not heard of him? Um, Herbert Brennan um, is an Anglo-Irish-American <laughs> filmmaker. He was born in Dublin um, in 1880 um, to, um, to Irish parents, Edward uh, and Francis Brennan. Um, more about Edward in, in a minute. Um, I could do a paper on him, to be honest, but, uh, but, we, we, but we'll skip ahead. Uh, he moved very quickly to London, grew up in London um, until he was about 16. Um, where his father worked um, first um, as a lobbyist for the Irish Land League, um, then fell out somewhat spectacularly with Parnell. Um, not, I don't think it's Parnell, I, don't, I really don't know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, uh, fell out with Parnell um, and then started work with a lot, um, as a theatre critic, which he did um, off and on throughout his life. He was also a poet and a writer in his own right. Um, and he worked for a number of... Um, uh, conservative uh, newspapers um, in London, um, writing for theatre, uh, writing for sort of um, about the West End. Um, Brennan lived with his mother and father till he was about 15, which is where they divorced rather publicly and acrimoniously, which was not a nice man, to put it mildly, um, uh, and um, Francis um, um, had, had enough of being abused by him, frankly, so they, they divorced. Um, Francis um, and Brennan and, and the rest of the kids moved to America, uh, where Brennan very quickly started getting involved in the theatre um, uh, until uh, from the age of about 1916, so about 18, 97, 98, um, until 1912, where he first got his first job um, working for a film uh, studio um, for IMP, International Moving Pictures, which after about six months would become something called Universal, which we might have heard of. Um, he directed a number of films for Universal. He became their first main director. In fact, he is probably one of the first main directors um, of this era, of, of the film era, to be honest, certainly in the US context. Um, his, perhaps his uh, crowning achievement during this period was not a film made for Universal, but a film he made for uh, William Fox, of 20th Century Fox, called A 
Daughter of the Gods, um, starring vaudeville star um, Annette Kellerman, and one of two movies he made with Kellerman. Um, Daughter of the Do Gods was billed as the first million dollar movie. Um, it was shot in Jamaica. Um, it was a response to Birth of the Nation, um, and a spectacular hit that film had been. Um, it wasn't a thematic response to it, but it was an attempt to make a sort of production on that scale. But this one involving mermaids and fantasy and, um, and creatures and magical lands and things like that. Uh, he fell out with Fox very spectacularly. Um, they quibbled over the rights of the movie and the overspend. Um, he then did a few years in the wilderness. He made a fantasy in 1917 called War Bride, which you see up on the, um, on the paper there. Uh, War Bride is an anti-war feminist fantasy set in an alternative mythical European land in which um, uh, women uh, organise to stop their sons being sent to, a, uh, to war. Um, the film did very well um, in the States. Woodrow Wilson was reported as saying that it was better than Birth of the Nation, um, which that film was famously the first one screened at the White House. Um, this was either the second or at least the second, its next rival. Um, it was doing very well, certainly until the Lusitania sunk, um, and then the climate <laughs> shifted and the film got pulled from distribution. This sent Brennan on a bit of a spiral. He lost, basically, uh, all his fortune. Um, he did a few wilderness years working for various companies around Britain, um, and uh, 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 Italy. He was kidnapped by Sicilian bandits. That's true. I've checked it in about eight different sources. He really was. Uh, <laughs> more on that if you want later. Um, he then came back to the States in 1923. He got a job at Paramount Studio. Um, Paramount, the biggest studio of the, sort of this era. Made lots and lots of movies for them. My favourite and probably, his, I think, his most significant artistic achievement uh, is probably the, is the first adaptation of Peter Pan. Um, Stan Philip in the front row here wrote the score, performed the score for the DVD release of it. So when I was intimidated before showing up at this conference, <laughs> now I've got <laughs> So, you know, if, if, Herbert, if you're in the audience, do uh, <laughs> <laughs> shout out. Um, yeah, so, um, but Peter Pan, he also made um, uh, The Ogest, uh, the, the, the French Foreign Legion uh, film that's been remade loads of different times since. Um, then went to Britain uh, from, 19, from the 19, sort of 20s around the era of sound and made a few films there until about 1940 when he retired. That took me a lot longer than I had planned to do, but um, hey, that's, that's Herbert Brennan for you. Um, probably the most well-paid and one of the most famous uh, film directors of this era and sadly isn't known about as much as many of the others. A quick quote from one of the few film historians that attempt to synthesise this vast career. Brendan pops up here and there in film history thanks to all this kind of vast back catalogue. Um, but he's, the, he's rarely talked about as a filmmaker with a cohesive body of work. Um, this is a quote from Richard um, Kosarski um, in his book Hollywood Directors 1940 to 1940, uh, which was published in 1976. Uh, one of the first directors to gain a wide personal following, Herbert Brennan's background included journalism, vaudeville, and the operation of a small town in Nickelodeon. He was one of the first great names behind the camera, unlike Griffith. Um, he knew how to play a studio game. Um, you can just sort of try and memorise that slide. It's going to come back later, and I think I have something to say about every single word on it. <laughs> okay. So, let's talk about Brennan's theatrical career. So, as I said, um, in, in my sort of history of his life, he um, moved to America in 1895, but he was a theatre man from birth. His father was a critic, um, and, he, and his father had made a lot of his money not only out of writing about theatre, but the world of theatre. He, he enjoyed the, the, the lifestyle of the upper echelons of, you know, wealthy theatre life um, in fragments of, of Brennan's autobiography that still exists in an archive in the States. Um, Brennan talks a lot about sort of interrupting dinner parties that his father would host with a number of different um, theatre empresarios and playwrights. Um, Brennan's a bit of a slippery character. I don't believe a lot of what he says, but according to him at least, we have figures like Oscar Wilde, J.M. Barry, um, and a few other empresarios um, we've heard about over the last few days attending these talks. Um, when he goes to the uh, States, he very quickly gets jobs as a, as a call boy in big uh, American Broadway shows. Um, I don't have evidence for how he get these jobs quite so quickly, but I've got a feeling it's connections based back in London. Um, a lot of the empresarios moved, of course, between Broadway and the West End and, and had either theatres in both or at least monitored the productions in both. Um, he got a job, uh, one of his first ones for Augustine Daly, um, uh, as a callboy on a movie, on a, on a movie, 
See? Um, <laughs> or in a play, I believe they're called. Um, called, um, <laughs> called This Sporting Life um, from 1896. I uh, read a lot of reviews of this play and I've had to assemble my understanding of it from the play. It seems to be a kind of big spectacular uh, play about two boxers. Um, it ends with a big boxing fight and there's a horse race somewhere in between the two. Um, you're nodding as it. Okay. Do you know about? The, okay, we'll talk later. Fine, perfect. Because I, I, I was listening when you were speaking about that. Bet this one fits in nicely. Um, it was uh, in the American press. I know it was a hit here in London. In the American press, it didn't do very well financially, and it's written about as being a kind of uh, an example of, of English um, novelty um, quite a lot. Um, it comes up again and again and again. This word of British novelty. Um, my suspicion. Um, given what I've read uh, and what I'm learning about theatre history, is that this is an interesting era that Frenham's working in, in that we've got the sort of rising sense of an American theatre um, trying to make itself distinct from British. Um, certainly within the Broadway scene, we've got you know the, the Dave Velasco and the rise of kind of naturalism, um, and I think there is a pushback within some of the reviews I've read in Broadway, at least, against the kind of perceived stagecraft and, and, and trickery that we've, we've been talking about. Um, but this is not true um, of America as a whole, but certainly this one originally didn't do very well. Uh, Brennan then worked for a figure called Walker Whiteside, um, an American actor, um, made um, a sort of splash when he was uh, for being Hamlet um, in Bully, Indiana, and he toured a lot of the sort of central um, states uh, performing uh, Shakespeare plays. But Walker would become um, a really important kind of mentor figure to Brennan. Um, they traded letters throughout their lives. They would go and see each other's um, new productions, um, films, and, and theatre. And, and Whiteside would write a lot about his desire to kind of incorporate what he would call kind of popular theatre art, um, artistry and artifacts um, with the kind of um, uh, the Shakespearean text that he wanted to perform. So he writes scathingly about kind of um, backlash he's receiving amongst reviewers for. Um, for using kind of really detailed scenery and trying to kind of do things like set the storm in the tempest in a kind of you know more um, elaborate spectacular fashion um, because it's seen as not proper or not Shakespeare um, at least in the context he's working in. I should say Brennan's working mostly in touring stock companies, not exactly the model that we've been talking about up until this point, um, and he's moving between different ones. But he walks for, walks for Walker Whiteside for about a year, and then um, the Dick Ferris Stock Company based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, Minneapolis is a sort of little hub of theatre, well it's quite a big hub of theatre at the time. Um, outside of Broadway it's probably one of the most significant space, spaces for theatre in the States where he works at a, a theatre called the Lyceum, again in a stock company. And again this Dick Ferris stock company, its trade seems to be the kind of melodramatic um, canon um, of, of, of similar plays that I've seen, in fact right back to day one when we were looking um, at the time sites, um, the time theatres um, uh, back catalogue, similar kind of roster of plays, um, but winning particular notary for its use of elaborate detailed mise en scène um, on the screen, on the stage. So don't do it again. Uh, <laughs> right. So I therefore think this context is really important both to understanding what Brennan is as a filmmaker, but also perhaps starting to keep, um, lay the clues as to why he's not talked about in the same breath as a D.W. Griffith, a Paps, um, these sort of early silent figures. In fact, a story to tell, um, uh, uh, I once um, mentioned that I was doing this project to, a, to a, an academic who will remain nameless, um, and they said, oh yes, I've heard of that, that, that adaptation of Peter Pan. It's by Herbert Brenon, surely. Um, <laughs> she's, not, she's not an unreasonable assumption if you're just coming at it from a film background. In the 1920s, there were a lot of French um, sort of... Um, uh, uh, yeah, um, immigration and, and lots of French talent working on the screen, but I had to inform them that he goes by Bertie. Um, so, uh, Brennan's films are theatrical. Um, he never saw, when he writes about cinema at this time, when he gets a job working for Universal, he sees the one real film cinema industry as very analogous to the kind of stock company um, labour practices that he's grown up with, you know, that the standard practice. Um, in this, these one real industries, you make about a film a week. It's given the brief on Monday, um, given sort of the rest of the afternoon to go and scout some potentially external locations. By Tuesday, they're filming the thing. Uh, by Thursday, Friday, it's ready to go, and it's up, and then, and then on to the next project. That kind of quick, 
um, collaborative and, and informal turnaround is part of the way the films are being made. One of the innovations he brings in as a director that causes his stock to rise a little bit uh, within Universal is his desire to collaborate more with his um, actors. Um, he insists on having a, a, a limited amount of rehearsal time um, for each take, which is um, not what is being done in theatre, uh, or sorry, in the one real industry at the time. Um, and he sees his films, indeed, as an attempt to kind of um, uh, capture, replicate, and sell through the medium of cinema the kind of spectacular mise-en-scene that he's grown up working in uh, with, these, with these companies. Uh, an example of this um, is the film that perhaps puts him on the map for the first time, a four-reeler called Ivanhoe, uh, which was made uh, released in 1913, um, an adaptation of Walter Scott's um, sort of epic novel. Um, Ivanhoe is made uh, here in England. Um, it's actually made, uh, it was made at Chepstow Castle in Wales, uh, where I'm going at the end of the month to learn a little bit more about some of the production because there's been a bit of work on it down there. And there's some stuff in the archives. Um, it's, uh, Brennan was basically given a brief by Carl Lamel, um, the, the head honcho of Universal, to go to England. Um, he'd hooked him up with, a, with an aviator um, to make a film. It's called Across the Atlantic. It's like a two-reeler. And while he was there, if other opportunities for making a movie came about, by all means make one so that we have to send you back there. So he, makes, he makes this across the Atlantic, just basically featuring lots and lots of flight from this aviator. He goes to France to make a film called Absinthe, um, about how French are losing their minds to this evil drink. Um, um, and while he's in England, he's got a bit of time on his hands, so um, he takes his actor, King Baggett, who's sort of the, one of the first stars of silent Hollywood, to meet... Uh, or to, 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 to visit all the London theatres. This is picked up in the British press at the time of, of certainly Bagot, no one knows who Brennan is at this point, but Bagot meeting the, the, the sort of, you know, the empresarios and, and the upper echelons of, of British theatrical culture um, and being received and dining in the, you know, attending the royal boxes and all this kind of stuff. Um, in May 1913, a production, production of Ivanhoe is staged at the uh, Lyceum uh, in the West End. Um, it gets very good reviews, and they're particularly interested in the kind of use of spectacle. There's a big kind of scene during the film that takes place in show, in the play where, um, I can't get that in my head, a um, play where um, they take away the wings, or at least cover the wings with, with branches to kind of create a sense that the forest is growing out of the theatre um, and onto the, the audience. Um, and I don't know for certain whether Brennan attended one of these performances, but I do know he was in London at the time, and I do know that they then sued him six months later um, because the film so closely resembled their production, at least in their uh, views. Um, so Brendan essentially, uh, you know, I've seen the film and I've read as much as I can about the play. A lot of the tr trun uh, truncations and simplifications between the novel and things are the same. My hunch is, is that he went to see the play and quickly got on the wire to the mail and said, let me make another version of Ivan Home. That's not to diminish the effort of what he does, though, because the film, uh, the film I, am, I do mean film that time, uh, the film itself, as you can see, kind of celebrates the kind of tableau structures of theatre, and it also takes advantage of, of the kind of rising, uh, a rise in the 20th century of kind of medieval pageant plays, and that's what I'm going to go learn a little bit more about in Chepstow, is that I think he tapped into to a lot of pageant performers um, to, to kind of replicate and, and present something on screen that he would have called intensified theatre or um, um, yeah, or, or, or theatre to the max. He didn't see cinema as something um, that's, that worked opposite to or had to somehow transcend theatre. It could be a vehicle to make theatre even more theatrical um, through the use of the mediating presence of the camera. And this is very contrary to his peers like D.W. Griffith, who very much sort of bought into the idea that the art of cinema came not in what you are filming, but the way that you film it, as a way of kind of holding off accusations of being simply just theatre or just like any other art form. Um, that anxiety, I think, feeds into how we read Brennan as a filmmaker. I'm not going to show this clip from Peter Pan, one, because I'm embarrassed because Philip's there, but two, because I'm running out of time. But if you can, if you, can we, sorry, I've messed up there, I think. If we just play it any way you like, just that's fine. Um, okay. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, is you? Terrific, and a beautiful story it is in all seriousness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I've been told by Martin to plug that uh, uh, Peter Will's Theatre are for doing a production of uh, Peter Pan this Yay. Christmas. Um, so um, apparently it's also going to be at the Theatre Royal, but I think we know which we um, Right, so, um, okay. 
So as you can see there, there's a certain theatricality, both to the camera positioning and the mise en scène. Um, indeed, I think it uses that light technique that um, Janice was talking about in, in her paper. Okay. <coughs> Something I actually think might be more. Oh, I don't know why this is coming a little bit late, but just to prove that that Brennan had, didn't abandon theatre and his interest in theatre when he started working in cinema. Um, he, he, he donated lots of money to various theatrical causes. He staged productions of theatre um, off and on throughout his life in the gap between productions. And he was an avid collector of theatre memorabilia. I'm tracing down exactly how much he collected because it seems to be somehow splintered between lots of different US archives. For example, here's an autographed scrapbook I found belonging to his of various um, uh, either cuttings or indeed autographs of um, theatrical impresarios. I'm moving here to see some names on here that we've already heard papers about and references in um, elsewhere. Um, so yeah, uh, just to kind of flag that up, there's some more here. Okay, so just to speak very briefly to, to I think another legacy that Brennan takes um, from theatre is his interest in the kind of social and or the informal industry of theatre, the networking opportunities, the, the kind of informal system of paper patronage that exists within the West End scene that his father makes so much um, of his investment and wealth out of. Um, his father wasn't born into particularly wealthy um, stock. He was very good at extracting money out of friends and, and wealthy individuals who he befriended. Um, I think Brennan picked up a bit on this. Um, he, at some point, when he gets to the States, joins the Lambs Club, uh, the Lambs Club being the sort of big, famous um, actors, actor, social club, um, migrated from London to New York, um, and then sort of took roots and, and has stayed there ever since. I don't know exactly when he joined, but I certainly know he was there prior sort of to 1914, 1913, before he became a film director. Um, I suspect it goes right back to his sort of early roots when he was working in, in New York um, in his theatre. Uh, he's also a member of the Friars Club, a similar, um, uh, similar place. Um, while he's there, while he's in these clubs, he may be friends um, a number of other actors who are working in cinema um, and who are growing more and more annoyed about their, the kind of ostracization they're receiving by selling out to the kind of novelty of cinema. Um, so they decide to form their own club, the Screen Club, um, which uh, you can see the cover of their uh, souvenir brochure uh, which uh, announces their first year of being a club, the Screen Club. Um, the first annual ball was held in April 1913, about a month or two before he goes to England to make Ivanhoe. Um, the Screen Club is an attempt to do with the film industry what had been done prior with these kind of other social clubs, and a, a place where people could meet, could socialise. There was a um, they rented out some uh, accommodation in, in, in the Upper East Side of, of New York. Uh, his mum, Frances Brenner, who was a painter, donated a painting to their front lodge so that they could um, have a nice, uh, nicely decorated front smoking room to sit in. Um, King Baggett, him of Ivanhoe, was the first president of the Screen Club, um, and Brennan served on the board of directors, the first board of directors. Um, if you'd like to read that synopsis, I can tell you that he did not attend Eton College. Um, uh, nor did he attend London University, that's not a thing. Um, uh, he did attend King's College and studied medicine for a year and then dropped out. Um, uh, the rest of it's about right, I think. Um, oh, except that bit about him uh, owning a moving theatre, he didn't own a movie theatre. Um, I, I don't think so, anyway. Um, but, so, yes. So obviously what Brendan's doing there is he's using the, the social structure of the screen club to present a certain image of himself. It's interesting that he highlights his Englishness, um, his, his kind of belonging to this kind of establishment class, um, and indeed that he highlights that he has some sort of uh, moving picture um, um, background. There's lots of things in this um, uh, souvenir brochure. A lot of it is the sort of, you know, what happened during the day. They did lots of things, they had lots of performances. There's an anthem. Uh, which we're all going to sing now. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's an anthem in there as well. Um, and then there's a page of commissioned caricatures um, from Sardi's Restaurant. I don't know if people know Sardi's, but it's kind of this famous New York establishment where it has lots of caricatures of, of celebrities around um, uh, the tables. Um, the, uh, so you can see caricatures of various different actors. The club is mainly dominated by actors. Brennan is one of the only filmmakers who is a member of the screen club. Um, and I suspect it's because, as, his, as he was an actor, 
he sat in the same room, he sat in the Friars Club, he's, he's sat in the Lambs Club and, and forged relationships with these people. There he is, bottom right, Herbert Brennan. And just judging by that, I don't think he was the top choice of, um, of the caricaturist's time or effort, uh, both in his placement on the page and the quality of the caricature. If we just go back here and there. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. In the last bit of the of the pamphlet, there's basically an advertising section. So anyone who, who's anyone who's either a member of the club or has a connection in the club, or I presume paid for the space, but I don't know all of that to be certain, to be found out, um, to advertise themselves to their fellow collaborators. By then, the Screen Club had gathered a little bit of momentum. It had delegates arriving at this annual board from Chicago, some from the West Coast, not many. It was still kind of transitioning out there, but certainly Chicago, Philadelphia, um, and it was seen as a kind of exemplary um, example of this activity. Um, so you can see there a page from the Edison producers, um, the Vitagraph directors, Vitagraph being one of the first um, and biggest um, film directors at the time. And then, if you scroll right to the front, the first advertisement, you see this. He is the only one to have a double page spread in the entire screen article. And I think Herbert Brennan and his IMP company is a slight uh, exaggeration of his exact employment status. I'm sure Carl and Mal would have been loving, loving to see that. He only joined the club about six months later. Um, I think there is evidence here of, of Brennan using the social structure of the cinema club to, which he's borrowed from the Lands Club, the Friars Club, this kind of world that his father grew up in and, and, and he's become immersed in himself, um, to position himself as a main director, as one of the uh, lights, as one of the shining lights. And to be honest, how he got the gig um, going to England without it, I don't know, because although he started to make a name for himself at this point, it's, it's not enough to justify this amount of um, exposure in, the, in, in, a, in a examination like this, not compared to some of these other ones that have got smaller space time. There is that. So, I said I'd come back to this, and uh, this will be my conclusion. One of the first directors to gain a wide personal following, that I agree with. Herbert Brennan's background included journalism, no. <laughs> I think he might have written one article once, his mum might have made him join a, like a, a youth camp for journalism, I found a little thing, but he, no. Uh, vaudeville, sort of, for about a year at the end of his theatre career, he did work a bit in vaudeville, but he largely worked in stock theatre companies, and the operation of a small town Nickelodeon, I've already said that's not true. Um, I think he owned a theatre and screened some films once, but um, he... Um, he was one of the first great names behind the camera, yes. Um, and unlike Griffith, he knew how to play the studio game. Potentially, but let's think closely about what exactly that means. Um, that's written as a dismissal. Richard um, Korsarski is writing in 1976. His book starts with a foreword from Francois, Francois Truffaut, the kind of originator of the auteur theory. This is 1976, right in the middle of the Hollywood New Wave. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a compliment. Um, but I think it could be, or at least it could be a way of seeing part of his innovation in that um, Brennan's knowledge of how to play the game is part of what he's bringing to the industry and helping to codify and, and, and solidify. But the game he is playing is not the studio game, it's a pre-existing game that comes from theatrical social practice, or at least those are my speculations, unless I'm wrong. <laughs> um, in which case I'd be delighted to hear about it over the next Q&A session in the coffees that follow. But thank you so much for your attention. And, um... <laughs>
um, spectacle you're expecting and then the spectacle that might come when it goes wrong and the play must go on. Have you got any sense of the plays where there was a kind of disaster? How did it affect the run? And especially with like a horse going into the orchestra, did people then come to see that maybe again the next night? Or was that maybe I didn't know right? what I'm going to say based on how you catch that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's like the sort of adage of there's no such thing as bad publicity, right? Mm. Um, and I think that sense in which the the sort of tension between the kind of planned and expected danger, and then the potential <laughs> of something going wrong, and actually the potentials of the machinery going wrong, and the wrong horse winning the race, um, but also the of man and machine in some configuration or another going wrong. I mean, it's absolutely part of the thrill and part of how that, that spectacle is operating. Um, I do think there's very few instances I've found where um, when the person has died on stage, um, they do actually stop the performance. Like, it's very much um, either, you know, literally drop curtain and it's concealed, or, um, right, well, let's wait for the next scene change and get the body. Um, and then continue on. And the only ones I can find where they've actually sort of stopped the action um, has been there's, there's about three or four instances where actually it's, it's one actor, and this is the sort of manslaughter cases, who has actually deliberately killed the other actor. Um, there's lots of sort of, you know, love affairs <laughs> um, gone wrong, obviously. Um, and, uh, and a couple of instances where they, they very deliberately shot the other person on stage. And I think that, that sense of what I was talking about, about this blurred boundary between what's stage business and what's actually life happening live, um, I think those are very clear cut moments because of the reactions of obviously the other performers on stage. Whereas with Crozier and a few other examples, a lot of the sort of um, uh, autobiographies I've read from the, the, obviously the other actors is that um, they just thought he was doing a bloody good performance that night. You know, they were like, wow, he's nailing it. Um, and it's the same thing with the weaponry as well. It's about, you know, well, if you're a really good actor, then you want the real deal in your hand because it's part of being in character, as we think about now. But there's also a thing there about, um, particularly in relationship to people like Charles Keane, that because they're such incredible actors, it's very dangerous to give them a real weapon because they're so in character <laughs> that, you know, they're going to throw a real punch. They're going to give that rapier a real kind of twist at the last moment. So. It's very much the sort of what we think about now as well as sort of contemporary acting practices and that, that notion of, of character and being in the moment and, and how actually the press in some way is engaging in that um, around realism. So, yeah. Uh, I've always telling people, young people who uh, wanted to get into theatre, that it's a dangerous place. <laughs> and it still is, and you have to be careful all the time. And there are still accidents that happen on stage and backstage to do with scenery, to do with uh, the, the, the things that people do. You just have to be careful. And look at the gun problem that they just had in America with that pistol. Uh, and that's, uh, and I know this is where people, well, I know a chief electrician who got his leg trapped in a revolt, and for the rest of his career he had terrible leg. Uh, it, it, it still happens, all that sort of thing. You just go off to open doors and you fall into nothing. I have no incidents where that's happened. So and, and in the same way as well, the, the stage machinery going wrong, so things like um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang mm -hmm. and the car not actually being able to come out over the stalls on various occasions. So in the same way, yeah, absolutely. There's so many sort of echoes and resonances with practice now. Hello, this is um, for Alex. I'm sort of interested in the ways in which the parallel with Griffith sort of comes back because he sort of mentions Griffith and you mentioned Griffith saying, you know, that his first film was a kind of um, birth of a nation, and then he, you know, he comes. 
comes to the UK at the end of the war to make the national film, and mm -hmm. Elizabeth with this comes to make whatever that which is called Film of Destiny, which I've now forgotten. Um, I then he ends uh, making quite a quickies, and kind of Griffith kind of, there's a point where Griffith is slated to come to the UK in the 30s and make quite a piece, but he's an alcoholic and can't get any work. And I'm sort of interested to ask. Like what did happen to Bernard in the end? Did, did he come back to Britain to make crappy films because, in fact, he couldn't get any work in the States? Uh, yes. Um, uh, he, so he came to Britain twice. He came to Britain um, in, in 1918, 1917, because he basically ran out of money. He went independent after um, the Daughter of the Gods um, set up a production company and a distribution deal with Louis Selznick. Um, worked with him for about a year or two until they fell out spectacularly. Um, and then basically was bankrupt, but did officially get made bankrupt because he came here before um, they could hammer him down. Um, so the war the war film was a, was a contract job. He did it for money. Um, in fact, I, I found letters of him writing to the White House saying, can I can make your film instead? Because the British people are asking me to go over there and I don't really want to. Um, and then he's writing letters back from, from the Lands Club saying to, to um, Beaverbrook, um, I have my patriotic duty to come and make this movie. I'd be delighted to as a proud British. But, um, Brennan was American, British, or Irish, depending on who he um, spoke to. Um, he then came back in the, in the late tw uh, 20s. He, he, he didn't find the transition from silent to sound particularly easy. Um, uh, and yeah, he took a gig working for a couple of British students. I think he found it very satisfactory, but I think he enjoyed living here at least. Um, and he stayed here till about. I think he stayed there off and on until about the late 40s. Um, and he did find an affiliation, my joking aside, with, with kind of his British identity. I mean, what, what nationality one calls him is really difficult because I think he's got elements of all three percolating in there. The, the Griffith comparison is made throughout their entire careers. There's newspaper articles popping up here, there, and everywhere saying basically who's better. Um, they're, they're, they're pitted against one another constantly. Um, and one film is used to measure the, other, the other's film. That. They were sort of friends. Um, he, he met them when they were both working in New York. Uh, I think certainly in his autobiography fragments, Brennan credits Griffith with kind of helping him think more pictorially about cinema and thinking of cinema not just as an attempt to film theatre. Um, but they had different disagreements over what that then meant um, in the way that I sort of alluded to in the, in the paper. Um, he wanted to end his autobiography, Brennan, with an image, it's quite a depressing image, but I'll end on this, with. Um, him and, Bre him and Griffith meeting um, sort of as, as retired men on Sunset Boulevard and then walking up to um, outside Brownlee's theatre and standing there watching people go in excited to watch a movie and no one knowing who the hell either of them was. And him turning to Bre uh, Griffith and saying, well, they've killed the golden goose. Or something like that. And, I, just like, and he's got notes from me there to say, this is a really bitter and resentful way of ending a biography. Don't do this. <laughs> They did have a working relationship, but it's interesting that the way they're both talked about, it's definitely two rivals going at it. Um, and then by about early 70s, Griffith wins in terms of who, who, um, who's the auteur. I think because of his kind of way of working against and iconic, his iconoclastic way of working kind of fitted the mold of the auteur better than Brennan's, oh, I'll work for you for a bit, you for a bit, you for a bit. Um, yeah, there's some thoughts, but not very really <laughs> just had three people put up their arms at the same time. Uh, I am, since we have well, eight minutes left, are there any other questions for Martin? Oh, all of you. <laughs> okay, all right. I think <laughs> you just hand it by and uh, you wait for the mic, please. Mine's quite a quick one. Um, I've been told stories about shifting scenery and flats and clubs and props by train. Uh, but I don't know if that, those stories told me were second hand, first hand or third hand mm -hmm. and the people who told me are no longer with us. Do you have a view of when it actually petered out? <coughs> what, manhandling sex? <laughs> By a train. So, um, Sunday train call. Basically when the internal combustion engine became cheap enough to take over. It's all gun and these days. 
Yeah, it might have been as late as the 50s, possibly. Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the railways were de deteriorating after the, the Second World War, yeah. uh, selling rotten anyway, and it was all going over to diesel and things like that, and uh, British Rail came into being, which was a pretty much of a disaster. So all the local uh, railway companies uh, were, were sort of stuck into one uh, bits and pieces. But um, the reason why um, the, the railways were nationalised was because they were losing money and they were uh, going bust, uh, which was all part and parcel of it. So it was ending a sort of... Uh, I mean, the only reason it got through uh, World War Two was because it was needed for uh, troop transport and things like that. So, so in, in that sort of thing. Uh, I just have a load of segments in, which is all the things that you are class network, so could you speak to the next Sunday? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. In the 1960s, I co-founded a company known as the Prospect Theatre Company. And if you bought 20 tickets, from Oxford to Leeds, British Rail gave free one scenic wagon. So you take the scenery from the Oxford Playhouse down to the Oxford Station, put it in the free wagon, and down to the Grand Theatre Leeds, the horse-drawn wagon would arrive and take your scenery to the Grand Theatre Leeds. I did this for about three years. I have no idea when it stopped, but I was told it had been in business for 50 years. You cannot keep horses out of the theatre in this <laughs> <laughs> And I will, I'll be grabbing Raphael and Martin later to talk about the modernity of putting horses on stage and the modernity of putting set versions of trains on stage as well, because horses are not equipped for moving in, that, in picture. Okay, fine. We have about four minutes left. Uh, you've been waiting ages. Uh, yeah, run. Martin, um, you made the case very clearly for um, people being able to get to the theatre and get home to the theatre. Um, is there any evidence that the theatre and theatres themselves here adjusted their programmes in order to fit in with the railways? I mean, is, it, is there evidence that it works the other way rather than just the railways responding to an audience need? It, as far as I can tell, it was uh, part and parcel, you know, half a dozen of one, six of the other. Um, they, they both adapted to that. But, I mean, you know, shows were long anyway. You know, they're, they're, often finishing sort of 11, 11, 30, and of course the entertainment's afterwards going on and that. So, um, and the, the, the normal railway um, things, apart from the excursions, that did tend to go on much later. Uh, you know, you could get a train from uh, Newcastle sort of half past one in the morning and uh, get home that uh, under the normal circumstances, uh, especially the long distance ones and that, and even that night train, uh, proper night trains where you could actually get, uh, get a bed on them as well in those days, of course. So uh, it, it was very much, you know, one adapting to the other and uh, using the, uh, the, the the things that are available at uh, that. And, uh, and of course, I have actually left out trams in uh, this uh, thing because obviously they run on rails and that. And uh, they, they had a, a part to play as well. But it, it was... And it depended on the on the, the, the theatre manager, as I say, some are more entrepreneurial than others, and that, and uh, and it depended on how long the pantomime was and, and things like that. I think we just about have time for one more question, and David has got his text. You know what, David? Uh, yeah. So again, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the front here. <laughs> Once again, I'm sorry, it's not a question. Uh, it's Peter McKinnon. This is partly um, a, a, uh, an expansion on Ian's uh, experience as well as Martin. That when I was in graduate school in the States in the 1970s, Donald Owenslager 
came and did some master classes, and he a great American scene designer in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And he said that if he had ever written his autobiography, which he didn't, he was going to call it 5-9. When I was in theater school, I was taught that all flats could be whatever height they were, but they were always 5 foot 9 wide, and nobody knew why. And Hornslager said it's because all the scenery in the 19th and early 20th century was made in New York and then shipped out across the country, and it had to fit through a 5 foot 9 opening on a railway car. And he said, the point of his article was, you can, as a stage designer, you can dream anything you want, but if it doesn't fit through a five foot nine opening, then you <laughs> should do something else for a living. Could you leave that whole second? Yeah, uh, we have zero time left.